This episode of Computer Club Lesson was recorded on March the 30th, 2015. Enjoy! Hello, welcome to Computer Club Lesson. This episode is brought to you by the Binary Guys. The cloud will be the uh, the small lesson that I give off from this talk. But do you, you basically got it now that if you store something on a web on a web page, if you're working from a web page, you're really using the cloud services. If you're using Windows Live Mail or Outlook Express, configured in a certain way. You're doing it locally here on your computer. Everything is saved here and everything works from here. The cloud then just becomes a vehicle for stuff to move through. Another, um, another thing that the cloud is able to do, it is able to now do what we call software as a service. And that entails you opening a web page like Google and going to something like Google Docs or even, the, even your calendar in Google. Um, and you put information there, uh, you retrieve information from it, you can look at it on, a, on an hourly basis if you like to keep track of what you're doing all day long. Um, you can make documents on software that's in the cloud, software as a service. You can make Excel spreadsheets. If you look at these programs, they look exactly like what Microsoft Office would look like on your computer. And they have 50% of the same functionality only 10% of which you would ever use. So making documents on the cloud, saving them on the cloud in, in, your, in your Google Drive or your OneDrive from Microsoft or wherever you want to save them, they're not local. They're not local to your computer. They're saved off there and you go to your account and you look at your documents as you've made them or make new documents or save documents to it that someone else has sent you. That's cloud services, Serv um, software as a service. There's a hundred other things that the cloud is now able to do. When we say software as a service, uh, you can expand that a bit and you can start talking about uh, programs as a service. So um, companies would use a, a, a service on the cloud to take care of their human resources requirements. Um, they are able to log into programs on the cloud, um, from sale, like from salesforce.com, which is a uh, customer relations management software as well as software to manage their employee relationships. This, none of this is local to their computers. It's all done on the cloud. And so they can share this information with other employees or they can share it with uh, trusted colleagues. Um, they just give them access to the account and they can go to the cloud and they can see what's been going on within certain limits. So there you go, that's the cloud in its most basic form. Um, and from there, uh, it's only going to get more and more and more services on the cloud, more and more programs on the cloud. Games are even now, instead of buying a, a CD and loading it onto your computer, you log into a cloud account 
and the game is just available there for you. And you play the game on the cloud. It's, there has nothing to do with your local computer, other than the fact that you're using the keyboard and mouse to send commands to the cloud to play the game. Where would I find it then to log in and make an account on it? Well, you already have one. Uh, if you use Outlook.com, you are using the cloud. Um, if you want to use um, the cloud for documents, the easiest one to do is, is to get, make an account in Google, uh, get a Gmail address, and then you've got an account. And from there, you can log, in, log into Google Documents, which is uh, documents, spreadsheets, presentation software, all of that stuff. Um, you can store items in your account. I think you get uh, five gigabytes of free storage. Um, and that's great because supposedly, supposedly, um, it's a safer place to put things if you want to keep them for a long, long time. By safer, I mean that if your local computer crashes or burns to the ground or you lose it, Everything you had in this box is gone. But if you save it to the cloud, you can log into those accounts and get the stuff back. So that's, that's the cloud. Any other questions about cloud? Is, is your stuff password protected? Yes, it's password protected. And you can see in this instance here, it's also security protected, HTTPS, Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure. It uses SSL socket layers, secure socket layers. And that's the same for, ev for every cloud service that you would use. It, um, I have not found one yet that is not encrypted in some manner or other to keep the information that's flowing from the cloud computer to your computer secure. It's decrypted at your computer and you can see it. It is never decrypted on the other end where someone else could see it without your encryption key or password. Hopefully. Outlook Express is another story. No, I mean, I mean, no. Outlook.com? Yeah. Your, your email? Mm -hmm. Yes. If you use Outlook.com, let me see if I can get into it and we'll have a quick look. Yes, uh, you have to uh, make sure that you have an account, an active account in this. Um, there we go. Now, this is Outlook.com. This is uh, uh, an email account in Outlook.com. And you can see that it has inboxes, it has folders. Uh, it has things that have been saved for later. Uh, it deals with your junk mail um, folders that can be made just like you would locally. On your local computer, you can do this in the cloud. If you have, um, and as a matter of fact, um, Outlook.com, you can use, you can have your mail redirected from source cable or any other uh, internet service that you have and if you start in a, a, uh, uh, an instance of Outlook.com with, with all of the information you need from your source cable email address, it'll all be forwarded here and kept here. So if this computer goes away, you have it. It's there. Do you mean I can go to somebody else's computer? And Log into your, your Hotmail? 
with your credentials, and it's there. Well, no, that's that's just about any other kind of mail that you want. Uh, Google Mail, um, you can um, you can use Outlook for other kinds of email accounts. Now, I use Gmail uh, for my business accounts. Um, info at thebinaryguys.com. I run that through Gmail, so I've always got it, and I don't have to worry about having a computer locally that I can get at to get at that mail. Yes. Is there a time limit on that? Nope. Can they wipe it out? Or? Uh, can they wipe it out? Yes, they can. Who's they? Who? They, the, own, <laughs> the, the owners of the, of the hardware and software, Microsoft in this case. But it's a very tough thing to do. It has to do with what happens when you die? <laughs> well, yes, it, it, and it's, it, it's, a, it's an important consideration for any accounts that you may have on the internet. What happens to them when you die? Well, that, that's fine, that can be done, but um, let us just say that you have important legal documents that you've been communicating back and forth with, with your legal beagle and there they are on the cloud. You, you should assign important accounts to be bequeathed to close friends or relatives in the event of your death. Because there may be important stuff there, um, along with the fact that um, your Facebook account, maybe some of your friends don't know that you've passed on. Well, the Facebook account is available for your relative to make a posting and say, gone now, <laughs> say your goodbyes on Monday, okay? Um, so th those are important considerations about accounts that you have on the internet. Um, have them fully documented somewhere with login credentials, username and password, um, to make sure that these, these accounts are taken care of properly. If it's your wish that they go away on your death, that's what someone else can do if you've given them the credentials to do it. So if they have the credentials, they see everything that goes on the cloud from the time you give them the credentials? Pretty much. <laughs> okay. It has to be someone you trust. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but th this, is, this is also part of, uh, it, sh it should be part of you wrapping up your affairs. Really? Um, what happens to your digital life if you become incapacitated or you die? Yeah, so it's an important consideration for the future um, and I would urge you not to let it go. Um, I have a book that I carry around on my bag and my wife knows where it is, if I get killed in a car crash while I'm out doing my work, that book has everything. Logins for everything. And, and account passwords for everything. She gets the book and she can give it to whoever she might trust to do this for, whether it's our children or someone she might want to hire to do it to take care of your digital life after you're gone. When Bill died, it, that would have been done, it would have been easier, wouldn't it? Yep, could have been, <laughs> so could have been. you had all your banking and all your financial on, on uh, you do it by computer and it's by password. Yes, now. Would that be legal for them? To <laughs> um, provided you're, you're, you're giving them. Um, I mean if you passed away. Yeah, right? provided you have made provisions uh, in say a codicil on your will. If they're your PA or yeah. 
Yeah, or or even uh, a, a, the, um, the executor. Yeah, but that has to be like a, a codicil on your will, maybe, to make sure that that uh, all of that information is passed to them. Now, your lawyer can go to the bank and say, uh, "This person is passed on. I am uh, I am the family lawyer and the executor. Please give me every scrap of paper that pertains to this person." And the bank is obligated to do it. But it, wouldn't wouldn't it be so much easier if this stuff was available to an executor? Who you trust um, to? Um, but there's nothing to stop an executor or a power of attorney to go in if they have the password. That computer doesn't know who's doing the transactions. Exactly, exactly. Like I said, it's as long it's as, as long as they have the credentials to get in, they're in. Um, like I said, and I can't repeat this often as often enough. Is you if you're going to do this, you have to to. Uh, trust the people that you're giving the information to. Spend it and the cop will bat with it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, any other? Uh... I had, um, okay, I was in Windows Live now. Yeah. And I sent the daughter in law some hockey pictures of the kids. And I said, Okay, I'm going to send you some hockey pictures. And somehow I did it in uh, Nancy Pelosi. Yeah. And then I sent it in cloud. <laughs> <laughs> it went in the cloud. It's gone. And she called me and she said, no, you've got to send them to me over again. There's an expiry date on them. She said, they'll disappear. Oh, okay. I know what you've, I, perhaps you've done this. Uh, because I do this all the time. There's, there's a website called Send Big Files. And, I, so I and, and you uploaded these big picture files to something like Send Big Files. And then when you did that, it gave you a link that you could email to your relative. And then they can go to big files and download them. Now this solves two problems. Most pictures from a camera right now are too big to be sent through email. Hence the name send big files. And the second problem is is that your upload bandwidth speed is only one-tenth of your download bandwidth speed. So you could do this late at night and tell the computer, work on this all night, upload all these pictures all night long. When the person on the other end of the email gets the link, they download them ten times faster than you uploaded them. So it's a convenience thing. Um, and if there's an expiry date on it, that's most send big file type websites put an expiry date of five days on. Yeah. yeah. But she said, she said, no, you got to resend them because they're only good until a certain date and then they'll be gone. Yeah. Said, okay. Yeah. Send big files. Yeah. Usually there's only about half a dozen, but then when I send them to my daughters, they only get them as thumbnail sizes, and they have to get bigger. Yeah. Too. Yeah. So yeah. JPEG. Yeah. So yeah. Um, when you're um, when you download pictures from your camera, or even the 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 chip card, uh, what's in the camera? is 20 times bigger as a file size. The, ca the camera and the computer and the chip work together to take that raw data of that picture and crunch it 11 times into a JPEG. So it's 11 times smaller as a file size. Then, if you but that, that file size can still be uh, between two and four and a half megs, which is big. That's big for email. So if you want to send that picture, then you have to resize it again to something down smaller. Um, I, I don't do anything, though, and I did learn attach and send it. Yeah, yeah. But, and I, but I can only do it 
do it through Windows Live Mail. I yes. Do it from Outlook. Yeah, uh, it's it's more difficult to do it through Outlook, but it can be done. When you do it through Windows Live Mail, uh, the email package will resize the pictures automatically yeah. if if you if you if you're using that. Um, but the two are working together. Your Hotmail account in Windows Live Mail is working hand in hand with your Hotmail account in Outlook.com because they are the same. It's the same thing. More questions? Yes, ma'am. Question, um, talking about hardware. When I get, when I get my new computer laptop with probably the latest Windows 10, does my little Canon 160 become a, a toast obsolete? Do I have to look at the whole package of printer and a la with the laptop? Do I have to look at all new stuff completely? How old is your printer? Yeah, yeah, I would, I would say start looking at uh, a new printer as well. Mm -hmm. Your, your brand new computer may very well find it and be able to use it and work with it, right. but uh, everything would work so much better with more modern equipment, okay. uh, seven, eight years newer than what you have. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, about the only thing that, uh, if your monitor is still good and you've got a fair size one, like a 19 inch or better. Um, then yeah, you don't need to do a monitor over. Um, if you if your keyboard and mouse are PS2, the little round ones, I would say get new P get new keyboard and mouse. USB the little flat ones. Um, but beyond that, um, you're you're probably good to go. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay, let's, uh, let's do a little investigation of that. Um, here's, the, here's the little volume control down here at the lower right. You've seen that before. No? Well, what you'll, have to, what you'll have to tell me or investigate for yourself is, is there an X through that little thing that looks like a speaker? And if there is, Sounds like a top. yeah, you can come up and have a quick look at it, just so you can recognize, so you can recognize it. Looks like a little speaker, and you see a little red mark through it. If you have that, your sound is turned off in the computer. Okay, and this is how you turn it back on again. You click on the speaker, and then you click on the blue speaker, signifying it's turned off, and you'll see that all of that went away. You now have sound back on your computer. Okay. Now there's a couple of other things. Don't confuse it. <laughs> about sound. So sound and computers has been a bane of existence since 1993. Um, the other thing that you have to look at is is the volume control on this all the way up to the top. If it's down at the bottom, of course you don't have sound. It's like any other knob you would have on a radio. You've got to turn it up to get the sound. Okay? Does that come up when you click on it? Yeah. Yes, when you click when you click on okay. the little speaker, that comes up. Now, there's also another entry here called mixer. If you click on mixer, it brings up the um, it brings up a panel to show you what speakers you have plugged in and where they're plugged in on a on a more modern computer. Um, if this was plugged into the headphone jack, it would say speakers on headphone. Okay, so you would know that um, your, your speakers, your plug-in speakers were plugged into the headphone jack. These, this is showing me the internal speakers are working. And you want to make sure that um, these, these levers here are all the way to the top. 
This is volume control for all of that. Uh, beyond that, I'm not going to confuse you, but that's the first things to look at. Yes. I don't have any of that on the bottom. When I can't get the sound, I get out of it and I leave it. Okay. Uh, these, what you're looking for is on the desktop. But my desktop doesn't have one. It should. Uh, when you, when you, if you hold down the Windows key and tap D. Oh, okay. Okay. That takes you to the desktop. That takes you oh, yeah. to what this looks desktop. like here. But and it doesn't give me, it gives me that. And it should give you this Nothing. bar on the bottom. Nothing. That bar's not there. Then your computer is configured incorrectly. Mm -hmm. You can get at it. You can get at it by, um, do you have your control panel icon on the desktop? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can still, you can, once you do that, you can still, you can still get at these, uh, these controls through the sound icon. Oh, okay. What's that panel from? This is, this is the control panel. Yeah. You can still get to your sound once you've got control panel opened. And it's called sound, is it? Yes. There it is right there sound. Now on, on your control panel, it may look like this. No, it's like what you just yeah. If um, your control panel looks like this, what you need to do is get it looking like what I just had. Okay. And the way to do that is up in the top right, you'll see a word category with a down arrow. Okay, your your computer may have been configured like that. We're gonna we're gonna talk about this configuration. Yeah. Okay. So if you have this page come up in control panel, what you want to do is get to all the icons that you saw before, and the way to do that is to go to the top right and click on the down arrow for category, and you'll see it lists large icons and small icons. And if you click on either one, large or small, all of your icons will come back. Okay? I'm going to click on large icons and fill the page up here so you can see them. There they are. Um, but everything that, is, that you would need to configure your computer properly is in these icons. You can change the date and time. Um, you can get the sound working if you fiddle with it. Um, you can get uh, your antivirus to work, in this case Windows Defender. Um, you can change your internet options. Yes. Can I turn my printer off from there? I'll tell you what I've done. My printer has a memory. I did not know this. And it ran out of ink. And I was... Printing, printing, printing? I've okay. Got seven copies of the tax forms and I can't stop it. <laughs> All right. Okay. It, it, let's let's get to Brenda first because this is this is relatively easy. In your case, where you want to go to is devices and printers in the control panel. Okay. And once that opens up, you will see your printer there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just for the sake of argument, I don't have a printer on this machine, but I'm going to right click on Microsoft XPS because it will do the same thing. If you right or if you uh, if you double click it, it won't it will open the printer dialog queue and it will tell you how many jobs are sitting in there, if any. Yeah. Big mistake. I didn't know it did yeah. That. You have to you have to delete every job in the print queue. Okay. Let me let me see if it'll yes, okay. There's the print queue, that's what it will look like. Okay? And every job will be listed in the print queue. 
and you just simply go click on document and if there's jobs in there uh, you will be able to to select them and turn them off or, or make them go away um, to delete the jobs okay it's already used half of the ink yeah okay that's work on that now there's another question over here yes Back to the page that you have yes there. is there a name at the top of that page not that page control page. yeah no no this one is there a name at the top of that page uh well just for control panel control panel all control panel items okay, okay. um I'm sorry, say again? Windows Defender. Yes. Could you speak about that after? Okay, Windows Defender. Um, in this case, uh, Windows Defender is an older version uh, because I should be using... Um, um, I have it on Windows 8. Yeah, Windows Defender... Uh, in Windows 8 is Microsoft Security Essentials. That's really what it is. Uh, okay. okay. And this is an older version of Microsoft Security Essentials. Windows Defender in, on a new computer is Microsoft Security Essentials. It's, it's a good program to use as an antivirus. It's a good program to use. Rather than buying something that is going to get in the way of what you want to do. Can you do that on the XP, which I still have? No, no. Windows, no. Microsoft Security Essentials does not work anymore. No, no. You have to use... Defender, I can't get that. No, no, it, it does not work. Uh, you, uh, about the only thing that works in Windows XP for an antivirus now is uh, Avast. Avast. Avast works... Um, even AVG doesn't yeah. work anymore. Oh, yeah, I just downloaded it. Did you? Okay, AVG and Avast are the two antiviruses that you can use. In fact, can I ask in. you a question about AVG? All right, let's try AVG. Okay, this is the window came up. Okay, try again. Okay, AVG, a window came up when I did a um, scan. And it says, tune up your PC, speed things up, regain disk space, and fix problems in three, in three steps. And please. Free one-time fix. Yo. Please do not touch any of that. <laughs> please do not touch. Yeah, in, come on to make you buy stuff. Yeah, it's a come on to, to, make, to have you purchase yeah, AVG. And, and it's, it's not worth the effort. Um, even AVG sometimes will, will make a pop-up saying that uh, your computer could be safer. Okay. A and, and, well, that's going to frighten you. Uh, yeah. What do you mean safer? How is it not safe? Well, it's there to frighten you a little bit to pry your wallet open to buy AVG. Okay? But if you've got the free version, that's all you want. Yeah. Now, on my laptop, I also got a window, and it says how to fix Windows 8.1 problems, and it's called PC Keeper, and it's Microsoft's partner. Is that another one? That Please okay. do not Fine. touch that. <laughs> okay, I, I get one from Adblock. It's, um, it says your Adblock needs updating. Okay, if did you use Adblock Plus? Did, did you download that? I've downloaded it. No, I know. Yeah. Okay, uh, if, if you don't have that program, I, I would just... I went to old programs and I couldn't find it. Yeah, that, so. okay. Then, uh, then something is trying to trick you into putting ad blocker uh, stuff on there. There is only one that I recommend. It's Adblock Plus. If you don't have it, you can go and get it. But that's the only one I recommend. Anything beyond that, um, I would say stay away from it. Okay, what is it? An ad, an ad blocker... Uh, stops pop-up ads from happening. Uh, I don't have it on this computer, I don't think. So you can put down Adblock Plus? Yeah. You can write another software program or something. 
I'm sorry? You have to buy a program for it. No, no, you don't have to buy anything in, in this vein of, of <laughs> ad blockers. Um, Just go to Google. Well, uh, for ad blocker plus, um, it's uh, available. Um, you can you can go to their website adblockplus.org, and from here you, um, if you're using. Uh, a Chrome web browser when you do it, it will give you this page. It knows what browser you're using. So it will install for Chrome. So it will install that as a Chrome extension. Um, if you do this in, in uh, Internet Explorer, it will give you a little bit different page because that's a program you have to load for Internet Explorer. So, but uh, an ad blocker uh, for Chrome is, is uh, quite a good thing. Now, I think I've talked before about uh, whether it's ethical or not. We've talked about the ethics of ad blockers. That's a decision you have to make about whether, uh, remember that um, you're getting free stuff from the internet um, and you're you're buying it with your eyeballs, okay? The web pages that you visit that are free are making ads come at your eyeballs. That's why it's free because the advertisers are, pay, are paying the website to host these ads for your eyeballs. If you put an ad blocker on, then you, yes, you don't see the ads, but you're still getting the free stuff. What's that? There's a name for it, but we're not going to say it. But is it, um, is it ethical to do it? That's something you have to figure out for yourself. Okay, I have a question. Yes, question. Sure, we can. Printers and devices. There we go. Okay, you've got a caution. Oh, it's as as an un, yeah as an unknown device. Okay. It's trying to look at this. Okay, it's trying to. Yeah. Now that's where I have caution marks in my, on, on the. Head. And does it does it say unknown device or does it does it give the name of the device? Asus and it shows my laptop and it's yeah. got a caution mark on it. Then it's got another thing like what they put. It, it looks like a hub to me. Yeah. That's got a caution mark on it. And okay. also my bottom one with yours has a caution mark. That's above, above. That's yeah, right. yeah. Okay. Um, these are prob uh, the reason that you're seeing them like that is that uh, the computer is seeing the device. And if it can divine a name for the device, it'll give you the name of what it is. Uh, a USB stick uh, with a name. Uh, may, maybe uh, store and go or something like that. And if it has that little triangle there, that means that it could not load the software that it needs to make it run. That's all. Uh, if you can still open the device in Explorer and see what's on it, and you still got that little thing there, don't worry about it. You're, it's working. Okay. Mine's working all right. Yeah. But I've got those three and I still can't get rid of them. And it keeps saying every time I right click on them, I go to, um, there's, uh... Well, if you say properties, in mine it says an unknown device. But under hardware, here's, uh, <coughs> it says it's an unknown device, and it, here's the clue. It says universal serial bus Universal Serial Bus Controller. Yeah. That is a USB device. Okay. Universal yeah. Serial Bus USB device. Now, your, your computer may very well have a couple of internal USB devices 
um, and the computer is looking at the, them and saying, well, you're not configured properly. We'll just give you uh, a warning about that. But if they're still working, fine. Okay. Um, That's what happened when mine had the blue screen. They reloaded yeah. it. Now they put in probably like what you're saying. Yeah. The other, the other thing that you can do and, and go and check, and if you can't do it yourself or the computer's not doing it yourself, uh, I might be able to come and do it for you. Um, is if you go to your computer, my computer icon, wherever you can get it, okay, and you right click <coughs> and you click on the word manage. Okay. Now this will open a panel where you can manage all kinds of stuff. But the thing you want to manage, the thing you want to look at, is device manager. Yep. Okay, so if we click on that, Lo and behold, all the caution marks are there too. Yes, and it tells you exactly what it is. Okay, well, not exactly what it is, but there's the caution mark right there. It's uh, it's an unknown device in the USB root hubs. Now, um, is there a reason for that? There might be. The the uh, there's it needs a software upgrade. <laughs> So what I might be able to do here is right click on it, go to properties, and then go to details. Okay, and under device description, if, if, you, uh, if you click on the arrow and click on hardware IDS, in this instance, the computer doesn't know anything about it, but it would give you a number. And you can copy that number into a web browser, copy and paste it into a web browser, and hit enter, and it will tell you all about it on the internet, whether there's software to make it run, or whether it's damaged, or whatever it is. But in this instance, I'm not worrying about it, because um, this it's looking at this device here, okay? And that's something I plugged in. Yeah. If I unplug it, that will go away. Okay. I troubleshooted it, and, and Windows can't fix it. Yeah. This is where it keeps telling me that they can't find the drive. Yeah, yeah. But if it's working, it may not need one. Okay. Anything else? After I right click on printer, what did you say to do to cancel all that stuff? Okay, we'll do it one more time here. Okay. Printers and devices. Yeah. And you right click on the device on your printer and you go at, or I'm sorry if you double click double, double, double click it will open the print queue if there are jobs stuck in there cancel them all if you may have to do it one by one or you can maybe do them all but double click and it opens up the print queue where you can cancel the jobs if you right click you can look at the printer properties, and it will tell you um, it will tell you whether the printer is being shared. It will tell you what port device it's using. It, it will tell you uh, who can use it, the securities of the of the printer, all of that. Um, so that's that's under printer properties. If you right click on it, and the other thing that you can do if you right click and you have several devices, okay, is that you can set whatever device you want as default. In other words, when you click print in a page, it will go right to that printer. It won't ask you, well, which one do you want to use? It'll go right to that one. If you, if you right click and then click, uh, put a check mark, set as default, okay? All right, uh, more questions, yes? Yes, yes. What all can I do with a split screen? What all can you do with a split screen? Um, I'm going to have to make it look like what you want because it won't do it by itself.
That's not how I would do it. No, but uh, your computer might very well do it by itself. Okay, um, so maybe let's let's say this is a, uh, what you're talking about is snap two screens. Okay, yeah. um, you can open up two instances of Explorer of your file explorer. You can go to a folder in one, go to a, a folder in another one that you want to move stuff to, open that folder, and just grab the folder and move it over. Boom. Okay? That's handy. That's handy. Does anybody remember Windows 3.1? There was the handiest little device in the file explorer of Windows 3.1. You could bring up four instances in one panel of all of your files. So you could have um, the computer file here, the root directory. In this one, you could have um, your user file here, your user folder here. You could have a documents folder on this one and you could have another folder open on this. You could move stuff around all over the place all day. It was so fast and so clean and so simple. Why did they stop doing it in Windows 98? It was so good. As a matter of fact, it was so good that there is a third-party program out there that will do that for you, and you have to buy it. It's about 15 bucks. But, so there, there's, there's the reasons for you to have a split screen, because getting stuff from, from one folder to another is just a simple matter of drag and drop. When you've when you've prepped the windows for what you want to do. It's just drag and drop. It's that easy. It's that easy. I do that if I put something on my desktop. Yeah. And I want to send it. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Yes. Do they? Oh, okay, good. Yeah, I want to know more about Avast. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Avast. <coughs> um, yeah, you have to update it every year, right? So if you've got 2014 in there, <coughs> sometime in the not too distant future, it's going to it's going to want an update to 2015. Well, you can just go ahead and do that. Okay. Yeah, but just be careful when you when you do this update that you're not updating to the paid version. Stop and read carefully. If it wants money, say no. If it wants money. Say no, but you've got to read carefully to do that. Well, read carefully comes along with installing all kinds of software on your computer, not just this one. Suppose I haven't got it to start with. How do I start it? Oh, how do you get a vast? Uh -huh. Okay, you can you can open up a Google page, and you can just <laughs> type in um, a vast in the search parameter here. And there it comes up, Avast 2015 download free antivirus software for viruses. With CNET? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> and, and please, please, um, this, this goes for all downloads. If you're looking for a piece of software, in this case Avast, look around for the software's homepage. Don't go to downloads.com or cnet.com or filehippo or any of those. Go to, go to the software's homepage. In this case, it makes it easy. It's avast.com. But if we look down here a little further, avast, free antivirus 2015, download cnet.com, you're going to get junk along with what you want. Yeah. Download CNET. Um, you don't want to go to the Play Store. Okay, here's File Hippo. Same thing. I thought File Hippo was okay. Um, I wouldn't trust it as far as I could throw a pickup truck. Maybe you might get lucky. 
The only other place that I trust on the internet to give me computer software that I can use is Major Geeks. Majorgeeks.com. That's the only other place that I would trust if I can't get to the software's homepage. Yeah, Major Geeks. So if, if you want to find software uh, for Avast, uh, you can type in Avast and then type in Major Geeks. How do you spell that? Major, as in major minor, geeks, like me. <laughs> okay, and there it is. In Major Geeks, there, there is a, a download for Avast. That's the only place, other place, other than the home web page of the software that I trust to get it. Okay? And please do likewise. If I've got access, Avast already on, does it automatically update to 215? Um, it, it will notify you. But here again, when it does, be careful about yes, what you're clicking on. Um, if you do it wrong, you'll, you'll be taken to the premium version yep. where it's going to want to be paid for. Uh, in some instances, you have uh, once the premium runs out in 15, 30 days, whatever it is, uh, you realize you made a mistake, you have to unload the software and put in the free version. Sometimes, some of these uh, will, allow, uh, will allow you to just change the version from uh, premium to free. Uh, I can't remember whether Avast does that or not. I think Avast has all three. Yeah. Read the words and you can update on the one or you want. upgrade. Yes. Be very careful. About uh, update and upgrade. Yeah. Okay. You do not want to upgrade. You want to it's update. Okay. Yes. They got a little promotion right now. They're punching up a window that yes. says you are get, being given a gift for so many days with Avast. Yeah. And that yeah. could be that yeah. tells me it might want to take me to the pro or something. Yes, yeah. it's it wants if uh, if you're given free for so many days yeah. after them days it's yeah. premium pay me. Exactly. Okay. Bad. Anything else? Yeah. Um, did anybody clean out their downloaded files? Yes, I did. I did what you taught us last week, and I felt it was a little peppier. How did you yeah. know what to take off? It had, had it had little had ticks on it, and I I wrote no, down no, oh no, I wrote no, down no, exactly no, what I was to no, avoid no, and what no, I was to avoid. I had all of this, but I don't know what to take off. Yeah. yeah. Well. Uh, <laughs> here's here's a list of all of the stuff that I've downloaded since uh, since I've been using this computer for our little sessions here. Um, if there is something in here that you want to keep that you might have to reload later, um, you can always go back to the website where you got it, or you can reload it from the downloads. In, in my case here, there's, there's a couple of things that I might want to keep. And one of them would be, where did I see it here, Caliber. Um, that's a special program that I have for man manipulating ebooks. Okay? I want to keep that. I don't want to have to go looking for it again. It took me a day or so to find it in the first place. Caliber. I want to keep that. Um, LibreOffice. I want to keep that as a download because I downloaded it and I loaded it on the computer and it works fine. So I want to keep it. Everything else that I can see here, um, I don't really need to keep. Does yeah, that list say desktop, my documents, my computer, local disk C, ABG, everything in my computer? Um, how, to get, how to get to your downloads because they're done. I went to start all programs, program. accessory yeah. system tools, disk C. Um, okay, disk cleanup is quite something else. Um, well, it gave me downloaded program files. Yes, and, and you could clean them all out. But what I would do before you do that... Go back. You can clean them all out? Yes, but yeah, with, with what you're talking about there, uh, the, um, um, doing it uh, from that system program we talked about last week. Yeah. But 
um, what I would do first is go into your user folder and into the downloads folder first. User folder, yeah, yeah. That's, that's your name or user or owner or whatever it is. Okay. Um, and go to the downloads folder and figure out if there's anything in there you want to keep. Because if you tell the program that, that we're talking about here, um, disk cleanup, if you tell it it brought up this page and to the yeah. right of that list it had conflict one, conflict two, conflict three <laughs> and these folders are empty and temporary Yeah. and all that. Can I just get rid of the whole page? If I didn't know that page was even there, can I pretend I never saw it? You can pretend you never saw it. <laughs> But if you do if you do a disk cleanup, please go to your downloads folder first before you do it and see if there's anything in there you want to keep. Because if you tell disk cleanup to clean out the downloads folder, when you go look at it afterwards, it's going to be empty. Yeah. Well, I what get a, should be in it? Only downloads. I get a notice every now and again and it says... Uh, Okay, unused, un clean up, cleaning up unused desktop icons. If if you have if you have uh, icons on your desktop that you use very rarely, maybe once every couple of months you might open something up. After the first 30, 30 days, um, your computer's going to say, "I've noticed that you're not using this icon." Um, I would like to be helpful and remove it from your desktop so it's not in your way. And if you do that, um, you may not be able to find that program because the desktop icon is gone. You, you'll have to go looking for it through the start menu. So I don't pay any attention. Yeah, you, you, uh, I'm, yeah, don't pay any attention to it if you want to keep all those desktop icons in place. Now, one other thing on an old computer, and this will be our, our last little talk about here, on an old computer, and if you have dozens and dozens of desktop icons, when your computer boots up, it has to go, one of the machinations it goes through is looking at everything that's on your desktop to see whether it's still valid. And if you have a couple of dozen icons on there, it has to check every single one of them. If you put it, if you put those icons, and uh, I think James and I did this, um, if you make a folder on your desktop called desktop holder, you can move all of those icons to that folder. And when the computer boots up, it's only going to look at one folder. This one. It's not going to do anything with it. It's not going to try and, and organize it, but the computer has to try and organize everything that's on the desktop before it can start. It slows it down a little bit on boot up. So to delete the, the icons, what do you do? Well, it, if you want to delete them, you can right click on, on the icon and delete it, or you can simply make a new folder on your desktop called desktop holder, yeah. and you can drag and drop icons over to that. You, you can just drag and drop? Yeah. I put them in the wastebasket thing. <laughs> well, then they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> so, when you open that menu on your computer, the same your folder one, do, the all, get do they all come up again? Yes, they'll all be inside that folder. In the same way as they are there? Well, not the same way, but see here, I've, there's a bunch of stuff I threw in there. Okay? Oh, I see. From the desktop. I threw all this stuff in there from the desktop. Oh. Yeah. So when you open it, they show up on your desktop. No, they op they show up in the folder. How do you get them back on the desktop? Oh, you don't want oh, you, well, if you if you see something there you want back, just uh, just drag it, back. drag it back. Oh, well, that's easy. Enough. That's easy enough. They don't make it hard for you. Who told you that lie? <laughs> They don't make it hard for you if you practice. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for today. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. I'll get uh, I'll get our videos off for you as soon as I can, and uh, that's it. Thanks a lot.
That's Computer Club lesson for today. Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.